So you're at the, you know, I'm a rookie at this, haven't, haven't ever done this before. Uh, nobody's ever done it well. So. <laughs> Bear, bear with me. Um, I want to welcome you all. Thank you all for, for coming. And uh, before we start, is there anyone here who's a, a new, new member? Or maybe this is your first event you've been to? Two? Right. Starting three? All right, well, we're kind of same, same rows. Donna, would you want would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hi, I'm Donna Rabtree. I'm relatively new to the South Four area, uh, coming on five years. And um, relatively new to the Historic Society. I um, started volunteering, working with Bob on doing some archiving of data and organizing data. And uh, volunteer at the Visitor Center on Saturday afternoon, so stop being here. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. I'm Paul Aswell, uh, about three years in Southport, uh, just interested in, the, uh, in your programs, and uh, volunteer at the uh, Maritime Museum, but not with you guys yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And the gentleman here. Yeah, I'm Mark Smith. I've uh, lived here in Caswell and Southport since uh, 2016. And we're finally retired. We moved down here full time in 2020. So. Okay. Well, I have, I have a daughter and son in here. Welcome. I, I hope you all, I hope everyone enjoy, enjoys our program program tonight. Uh, let's start with the, the Pledge of Allegiance. Flag is up, up behind you. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I'd like to introduce Donnie, Donnie Joyce, one of our board members, and Donnie will give us a big prayer. Can you all hear my hear me? Yes. A little, little more. Okay. Go ahead. Let us pray. Almighty God, as once again a few of your humble servants have gathered gathered here to uh, listen to the history of the South Old Historical Society. Lord, I ask that if you would bless this congregation, all of those here and on the way, and the speaker. And if it's thy will, Lord, I ask that you send your guardian angel to accompany each and every one of us back to our loved ones, safe and sound. These and all blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Donnie. Was that better, Donnie? Yes. Super. Um, I really hope all of, all of you, all of us, have had a good summer. And I'm, I'm really happy to report that the society has, has enjoyed a good summer as well. And that's including a very successful online auction where we sold all, all 15 of the old historical mark markers that, that we had replaced a few years ago. Um, we, we grossed almost $10,000 in the, the sale of those, those markers and we will, uh, our partner, <coughs> with the, uh, the markers and the auction is the Southport Beautification Committee. So we'll, we will be dividing the, uh, the net between the two organizations. And that they're, they're great partners to, to have. Uh, on another front, we were able just uh, not too long ago, able to expand access to archived copies of the State Board Pilot. And we had them online from 1933 to 1977, but we've recently been able, been able to expand that from 1935, or actually 1935 to 1991. And that's all on, online on the Susie Carson online research uh, room. 
Uh, we're also looking to take that up to the year 2000, sometime within the 2024. Uh, the old jail had another successful season uh, with the, actually the month of October to go that made it even more successful. So it had nearly 2,800 walk-in visitors plus another, at least another hundred uh, people who went through the old jail as part of the pr uh, private, private tour. And we have a, a good number of old jail docents here, here tonight, eager to hear about Jesse, Jesse Walker, so they can share the, share the tales with the, uh, the visitors to the old jail. So that's a, that's a brief update, a brief report uh, of our summer highlights, and later I'll be sharing our upcoming October and November programs. Now I'd like to introduce Mark Koenig, who is going to be our speaker tonight. Mark is a native of Wisconsin, and he has a, a master's degree in business. He had, um, I guess, the first part of his career was uh, in healthcare management, and then upon moving to Wilmington, he directed the Wilmington Railroad Museum. So over the past three years, Mark has published two books, and each of these books, the first was the Wilmington Brunswick Southern, Southern Railroad, and the, the second was Most Wanted Man in Brunswick County. And this is the story of Jesse C. Walker. And Mark will be talking about this, this about Jesse this evening. And we'll catch another program a little later, later on about the WBNS, which of course we all know that WBNS stands for Willing but Slow. Thank you. The story about Jesse C. Walker talks about, is about a man who, starting in 1908, <clears throat> murdered, shot the sheriff, shot the Brunswick County Sheriff, and killed the Brunswick County Sheriff, Jackson Stanley. And then he went on to another murder. And you know what? I should probably ask Mark to come up here and tell the rest of the story. You're going really fine. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the check. <laughs> Good evening to you all. First ran across uh, this character in writing my previous book about the railroad. Jackson Stanley, the sheriff at the time, was uh, an initial shareholder in the railroad. And in, in the newspaper, in uh, newspaper research, the articles, and so forth, I discovered uh, certainly news about his, uh, his uh, assailant and as well as his passing as a result of shooting. Uh, but then in looking through more of the newspapers and searching by terms, I found the name Jackson Stanland in 1915, 1919, 1935. And I said that this guy had an act, more active life after he died than before him. But the stories weren't about Jackson Stanland. They were about the guy who killed him. So dug into that story a little bit and it just got more and more interesting the more I dug into it, and uh, certainly happy to have the, the help of uh, Bob and, and some of our friends here in Southport to kind of fill out the, the background a little bit and get more information and other people from Brunswick County. Uh, in fact, uh, Bob and I were in jail together. <laughs> but uh, we're going to start, uh, and, and, so, and we're going to start with a familiar setting. We know those scenes, don't we? 
At the time, uh, this is back in the early 1900s, Southport was generally quiet, uh, characterized by your lovely seaside nature, no container ships going by, uh, but the shrimping and fishing were mainstays and pilots would regularly go out to meet the ships and get them through the shallows and, and up the river and navigate that. Uh, most of the happenings fans, uh, focused on church, social activities. Uh, as a county seat, of course, uh, the town was a center for uh, regular meetings uh, of the commissioners and quarterly court sessions. Court was only held four times a year, along with the commercial enterprises that line, line the streets. Uh, there was only a population of about 1,400. It wouldn't be hard to know everybody in town, or at least their kids, who often got into trouble. And uh, everybody mostly knew everybody else. Uh, visitors and day trippers from up in Wilmington would come down uh, the steamer in Wilmington, uh, Captain John Harbor's boat, uh, spend the day here and go back later on. Uh, even less happened outside the hundred blocks or so that comprised Southport back then. Uh, where we had small coastal settlements or inland settlements uh, sprinkled throughout about a thousand square miles of county land. It's an awful lot of land for not many people. Uh, it was occupied mostly by trees. And some of the scenes from the time, of course, include uh, Moore Street, they recognize at the top right here, Howe Street. No curbs, no sidewalks, no problem with parking either. Uh, the, the, the picture shown there has just a horse standing in the middle of the road. Uh, that's, that's what I parked. And of course, uh, down in Shalot, uh, it's even a little more primitive there. Uh, but there we've got the combination post office, uh, general store, and uh, the uh, the handing off mail to the route carrier, the, the, mailman, the mailman, who would go out on um, uh, deliveries. On the interior, things were even more primitive than that. Uh, but uh, this is uh, part of the area where Walker's backstory emerges in bits and pieces from uh, news articles. Uh, what we know from his early years is kind of fragmentary, uh, but that's not, a, that's not an unusual circumstance. Uh, he would have been born at home, likely in 1882, either in Columbus County, up uh, in this area here, somewhere around there, or perhaps down in Meadow, in Bullock County, Georgia. The accounts vary. They've got him being born in both places. They have him living in both places. Uh, there's anecdotes putting him there at different times. Uh, I suspect that he had, uh, he, he related to kinfolk later on in life, uh, up around Whiteville and and over in, in this part of Columbus County. I mentioned that a couple times and uh, saw that as a refuge, which we'll find out about. He had basic schooling through fifth grade. So that's what counted for schooling back then. He could read, write, do his numbers. Uh, it was apparently sufficient enough. Uh, but he also had a quick mind and imagination. And from what, uh, what I can pick up from the stories, he liked to read a lot. Uh, so he was uh, uh, probably stimulated by some of the imaginative stuff that he ran across. In in books, and uh, and also from what he had heard, uh, maybe up in Columbus County, uh, maybe maybe his paths crossed with those of hobos or seasonal workers who often had tales of their adventures out in the wilds and out, out on the roads, uh, meeting up with people. Um, but by the early 1900s, if they he was uh, that's our guy. That's a young Dusty C. Walker, very boyish. Um, he was in uh, the business of selling pirate organs in Georgia on an installment plan. The old pump organs, you know, 
uh, classy thing to have in your home, but they were also kind of pricey. Uh, he operated probably as a, a traveling salesman, collected down payments on the instruments. Uh, he neglected to send the down payments to his employer. <laughs> so that was a, sort of his first little brush with uh, the law and a little bit of a petty embezzlement. Uh, after pocketing his money, he ran back to Columbus County uh, here in this state, the Kinfolk in the area. And at that time, uh, the Wackamaw Lumber Company was deep into major foresting around Bolton. They're clear cutting all this area around north of the Green Swamp area. And uh, the eventual plan was to convert it into farmland. But uh, in order to do that, they had to develop a little bit of a tramway, have a track through the heavy forest, have a little networks off of that, a little railroad that would uh, uh, carry logs back to the sawmill and the lumber operations in Bolton. Uh, perhaps following that path, he drifted down to Shalot. Uh, there were some opportunities there that uh, were beyond what he could find in rural Columbus County. Uh, he was friendly. He could spin a story. Uh, I've got uh, some recollect, or I've got some family recollections from the Robinson family uh, of Brunswick County, and they said he was a he was a smooth talker, smooth operator. Uh, I guess if you're in the sales business, that helps to be able to spin something. Uh, he could be persuasive. He was, uh, looked youthful. He looked youthful. And uh, he came across as a bit of an adventurer and was likely familiar with the railroads and travel from his other escapades. He first represented himself as a picture agent, which I suspect uh, from, from some of the readings I've done. That would be like a recruiter for models. Uh, illustrated magazines were very big at the time. And uh, uh, he, he presented himself as somebody who would go out and recruit models. Maybe like a talent scout, traveling talent scout. Uh, he didn't seem to uh, think things through very much, acted on impulse, uh, and possibly kept up with his reading. Who knows? This is one of the uh, the dime novels of the time, Tip Top Weekly, Frank Meredith, all sorts of adventures out west with the Indians and robbers and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, kinds of escapades that were out there. But he took the time uh, when he was in Shalom to establish some respectable connections with the Leonard family. And uh, they are long time, long time residents in the country by that time. He ditched his picture angel agent pretense. Uh, he may have hired himself out to the elder Leonard, uh, who had uh, some commercial interest in Shalot and had a mill found by Lockwood's Folly and, uh, and was highly respected in town. Uh, he also made himself friendly with uh, uh, Mr. Leonard's five children, one of whom, Rosa, Rosalie, uh, he courted and eventually married. I suspect this is a Wedding picture of him from 1906. Now this time he's 22 years old, or 20, almost 24 years old. So uh, he's definitely a boyish, youthful sort of uh, uh, character. Uh, and uh, he left. He left uh, with Rosalie, went back to Matter, Georgia, uh, and got into the disturbance there when somebody in town uh, killed a pet cat, a kitten, and uh, and we just drifted off the off the program. Let's see if we can get back to that. He got into trouble when somebody killed, uh, killed his pet cat, and uh, he apparently uh, had too much to drink and disturbed the church meeting and accused the person and uh, created quite a disturbance. 
uh, enough so that he vacated town uh, down from Metter and came back to Shalot without his wife. His wife was pregnant at the time and uh, probably couldn't take the travel. Uh, once back in Shalot, he established himself as a bit of a shiftless character. And uh, plus now he had parental responsibilities. Uh, he began to feel a little bit cornered in, I think, and decided that the army was the way out of his predicament. So he joined up, most likely recruited in at Fort Caslin over here. That's an era of the military installation at the time. Uh, but not too long after, he grew restless with that regimented military life and uh, deserted in 1908. Back in Shalot, he became more daring. Still wasn't gainfully employed, uh, but he was suspected in a series of breaking and entering incidents around town, and uh, eventually one at a store with a couple of local helpers. Uh, one, one young drifter, another uh, boy on, on the move from Georgia, and one of the Leonard boys. Uh, that came to the attention of uh, Sheriff Jackson Stanley late in 1908. Uh, he'd just been elected to a second term in office. Uh, he, had, he lived in Shalom. In fact, both those houses are still standing down here on Main Street in Shalom. Um, and uh, Jackson had a, a large family. Uh, his wife uh, there uh, with him. Uh, they had nine children. Uh, seven children. Okay. She, she, uh, she bore nine children, two of them died. But uh, the two of them and the seven kids in that little cracker box house there. <laughs> and uh, he was in the process of building a much larger uh, house next door. Uh, so the sheriff drew up with his warrants for the breaking and entering incident. Uh, but then you know, he had also gotten notified from the army about Walker's desertion from that, so he had a warrant drawn up. For, for that as well. Uh, Walker made himself scarce. Uh, if anything, he had his ears open as to who was looking for him and why. And the sheriff was unsuccessful for a couple of months to, to get him to corner him to uh, uh, serve the papers. Uh, finally, I think on a tip, he went with a posse to serve the warrants and uh, uh, I believe it was at his father-in-law's house in Shalot. He surprised Walker at dinner time at his in-law's house, walking in and announcing the rest. He had a, he had a team, a couple posses came from the back door, he came in the front door and uh, announced that he had uh, warrants for his arrest and announced that. Uh, at this point, uh, Jesse uh, pulled out a pistol that he was concealing in his lap and just started firing like crazy. Uh, it was one of the new model army, army automatic pistols. One of the first ones that had the magazine that you fit the handle and, uh, and go like that. And he probably was unfamiliar with the automatic aspect of it because he did bang, 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 bang. Uh, he was restrained while still shooting and subdued, held at a local store. He's outside that store, tied up uh, and pictured there. And uh, the store had a telephone. They had only one of two telephones in Shalom, hard to imagine. Uh, then uh, he brought the jail in Southport and held over for trial. <laughs> the, uh, a couple times we're going to see from the newspaper photograph, which is a pretty poor quality image, uh, but I had a, a local artist do some pencil drawings. Of, uh, of him from photographs. We'll see a couple of those later on. But uh, yeah, so here he is, uh, now 26 years old, shot the sheriff in jail, and uh, getting used to what we might call new accommodations. Uh, he bided his time for a couple months. This was in November, end of November. Uh, he bided his time for a couple months. Uh, he was very likable, being, probably being a very agreeable and chatty kind of guy, very friendly, outgoing. Uh, he was held in the security cells, and for those of you familiar with the jail, you know just what I'm talking about. The box inside the box inside the box. 
uh, what the bard says. Uh, I have no idea if he had visitors or not. He may have had, uh, probably from an attorney at least. Uh, these were long idle hours, and I suspect that uh, based on later events, he used those long idle hours to scrape a weak spot on uh, one of the links of the chain, which is the shackles. It's a cement floor upstairs, as you well know, and just constant rubbing, 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 weakening a link there, and, and making his plans. And when the opportunity, opportunity arose, he was able to uh, uh, break the chain, and also, uh, he also broke off a piece of the scrap iron that uh, supported his uh, mattress there and uh, broke the locks or other chains and managed to get out. He assaulted the jailer and uh, managed to subsist that way. And uh, the two of them were, were, were together until uh, finally uh, almost, almost cornered uh, the uh, uh, Jesse took off and left his uh, young partner behind. He probably saw his arrest more as a rescue than anything else because they had been out uh, for that long. Walker himself kept on running and uh, apparently hopped the train out of the area. The tracks of the old uh, railroad ran straight through there towards Whiteville and he probably hopped the freight on his way out. And now we're going to jump clear across the country. Mm -hmm. Most likely uh, hoboing his way, he made his way to Oklahoma of all places. Uh, perhaps he was recalling tales of the Wild West from the dying novels, which were, were so popular then. Uh, subsisting on petty theft, odd jobs, uh, and under an alias of Paul Williams now, and two accomplices, they tried a train hold in 1909. Uh, gunfire. Uh, ensued between the would-be robbers and the train crew. Uh, there were a couple constables in the area riding through on the grounds. They heard the gunfire. They showed up and joined the scene. And so the, the, uh, three, the three would-be robbers uh, were caught between gunfire from the train crew and gunfire from law enforcement. And somewhere in the, in the flying bullets, a deputy constable was killed. And uh, but uh, Walker himself, as Paul Williams, was uh, subdued and arrested. He was wounded, he recovered from his wounds. Uh, some months later, he was uh, tried in court and sent to the brand new uh, Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. And it's a picture of that prison. Uh, it was in the process of being built. Oklahoma just, just decided, just late to uh, uh, keep their inmates in state instead of sending them off to Kansas. Uh, they had their uh, returned inmates uh, busy at work building the prison. And interesting irony there that uh, uh, the prisoners took pride in building the quarters that were going to confine them for the next 15 or 20 years. And uh, our hero. Uh, Lasted for about four years, and then he escaped from Oklahoma. In 1915, he made his way back to North Carolina. Uh, once again, probably a good deal of riding in a boxcar Pullman, as we might say. And after some time with his kinfolk, again in Columbus County, he surprised his brother-in-law uh, in Wilmington, uh, claiming that he wanted to get back to Shalom to see his wife. And uh, they had a couple of days, and they weren't able to, to do that right away. Uh, but here's the two of them clowning around for a little, little uh, candid picture, probably one of the studios in downtown Wilmington at the time. Pair of tough guys, you know. Or, or. And uh, uh, they uh, tried to bicycle their way down from Wilmington, uh, but the return when well, that was impractical. And uh, the next day, he was recognized. Uh, after a meal, uh, and word got to the local justice of peace, and after an undercover operation, they, they apprehended him on the sidewalks of, of Wilmington and some, sent him back to Southport under protest. The uh, nature of, uh, of, of all 
this kind of stuff. Um, they finally got to have a trial of the murder of the sheriff, but the, the, his attorneys were successful in changing the venue to Burger Hall, Pender County Court, in, in, in 1909. And uh, there was a that, that was an argument that was successful, but it was also a big problem for uh, the justice up there, Justice Roundtree here, no nonsense kind of guy. This would have been in July. Uh, July was not a cool month in, in Pender County or anywhere else in the old courthouse that used to stand up there. And uh, uh, the, the, the judge's docket had, uh, was pretty crowded. And here he was uh, faced with a first degree murder case where uh, his attorneys were lining up uh, maybe a hundred witnesses. And uh, the judge was, uh, had written up an order for a call of uh, 200 juries to go through, jurors to go through to select a panel. Uh, he had another murder trial on his docket. He also had about 100 angry farmers who were complaining about citations they had gotten from uh, the state relative to fencing the property alongside railroad tracks. And, uh, and this is in July and not air conditioned. And he's not anxious to sit on the bench that long. Uh, as it turns out, the uh, one of the requirements for type of murder that was being tried as premeditation, which they said didn't exist at the time that uh, Jesse Walker shot the sheriff. And so they argued it down to a guilty plea for second degree manslaughter. And Jesse was sentenced and sent to Raleigh to the Central State Prison. This uh, rather grotesque pile of brick and all that kind of stuff alongside uh, Seaboard Railroad tracks up in Raleigh. Uh, he has a troublesome inmate up there. Didn't like uh, being confined in the regimentation. He filed uh, certain complaints about working conditions on the prison farm up near Halifax. And uh, enough so that they got returned to the main prison. And somehow in 1919, he escaped prison again. Uh, investigations don't really reveal how that was done. I don't think it was crime working up the wall that got in New York. But uh, some of them made it out and probably hitched the line on, on the train flying past the prison right there. Later accounts now uh, bring me in 1920, the next year, to Mississippi. He arrived in Mississippi around uh, 1920, around Crawford, and uh, Crawford and Brooksville in that area. That's about two thirds up the eastern portion of the state. It lies between West Point and Meridian, along the Illinois Central tracks, and he found himself a new name. I don't know how we're going to call him Frank Manning. And he got uh, familiar with his surroundings, and uh, he also courted a girl and got married there. <laughs> uh, and she was about 20 years younger than him. Uh, they moved around to a few towns in that part of the state, uh, not staying too long in any one place, but eventually they uh, got down to Gulfport in 1926. Uh, they bought a modest cottage just, just outside of town uh, near the shoulder. And they also took opportunity to get established there in Gulfport. Uh, probably Jesse was turning over a new leaf, or maybe he was under better control from his new wife, and they joined the church. He, he didn't have a trade uh, that we could talk of, uh, instead uh, he subsisted with occasional work and what was called collecting, which I think is just going around picking up loose scavenged items and uh, sorting through them for things that could be resold or bartered. Uh, but in making his rounds, he ingratiated himself with community leaders in, all, in different parts of, of Goldport. Gold uh, and he, had, he still had his easy, friendly manner and uh, offered chances to uh, gain some acceptability in Goldport. Apparently, his wife was the wager. 
They found a place among the church going folk. In fact, they joined two churches, maybe mentioned the vets, one, one, one denomination or another. And uh, after attending uh, revival services in 1932, uh, Jesse became enlightened. Uh, these revival services were popular events during the Depression. Uh, but he, you know, he more than ever became a model citizen and uh, with his gift of gab became a bit of a natural evangelist. And that was in 1932. Uh, also in 1932 came out a very popular film. And maybe you've seen this on TCN. I was a fugitive from a chain gang. Uh, the film starred Paul Muni, but it was based on a uh, a, a serialized story in True Detective magazine at the time, and uh, also turned into a book afterwards. And uh, extremely, uh, extremely popular. My guess, I can't, I can't support this, but my guess is that uh, given uh, Jesse's reading habits, he may have picked up a copy of True Detective and recognized a lot of similar elements between the story told there and his own story. The story being one of a, uh, a person who was wrongfully accused of a crime, sentenced to prison, escapes from prison, um, and eventually uh, is uncovered in his new life. Uh, you, you may have seen the, you may have read the story, or maybe seen the movie. It was playing all over the country. And in fact, it was nominated for an Oscar. And at the same time, although being the Depression, he was forced to go on public assistance. Uh, in 1935, he told his wife, I've had enough of this. I want to go back to Georgia. I think about, I, know, I know somebody there. Maybe I can find a job. I'll get there and send for you. And uh, so with uh, probably packing a good lunch, he set out uh, to return uh, to the southeastern part of the country. Yeah. 1935. The year he left, uh, you know, about six weeks or so after he had left Gulfport, uh, he shows up at the state prison again in Mali. He claimed he wanted to uh, see the, uh, uh, the warden. He was mild mannered, he was meek, his hair had turned all white, he was only 52 years old. Uh, he eventually got to see the warden and said that he was here to turn himself in and to finish his sentence. And uh, it took a while for them to figure out why he was turning himself in in the first place. Uh, the records that they had would have been you know, back in the teens. And, but eventually they found out uh, why he had been in prison and, uh, and this record of his escape. So they rebooked him, locked him up again, and here he sent a letter to his wife, very dutiful, I guess. Um, and in this letter, he says, I'm not Frank Manning, uh, I'm really Jesse Walker. I didn't go to Georgia, I'm in North Carolina. Um, I'm in prison, by the way, to serve the rest of the sentence that I skipped out on uh, because I killed the sheriff in 1908. Uh, I can't imagine what reception that letter would have gotten from his wife, uh, but she stuck with him. Uh, friends and associates uh, got together, supported her, and uh, she went up to Raleigh to be with him. And they launched a petition drive based on their recent knowledge of him as a model citizen, arguing for clemency. And about this time, about this time, the uh, authorities in Oklahoma got, got wind of uh, his reincarceration and uh, through nationwide notices. And uh, they notified North Carolina that when you're done with him, send him to Oklahoma because we're, we're not finished with him yet either. <laughs> uh, finish his sentence later, um, which was another surprise for his wife. She didn't know about that yet. So, oh, okay, so we go to Oklahoma. Uh, eventually, uh, released, he was released from North Carolina after a year of good behavior. Uh, and directly in the custody of uh, Oklahoma authorities who uh, drove the 800 miles to McAllister and, and uh, incarcerated him there once again. His wife followed him and worked in town while he applied for clemency and 
They endured the waiting period. Uh, finally, he was paroled after several months. Uh, Oklahoma's prison facility was intended to hold all the prisoners in the state, unlike North Carolina, where they farmed out the prisoners and work gangs and, uh, and, did, and road projects throughout the state. Uh, Oklahoma's prison was probably overcrowded, and they were probably happy to uh, take this good behavior guy and, and go ahead and, and parole and eventually pardon him. Uh, there's a picture of him in his Oklahoma <coughs> uniform right there. And his original his original booking number from 1910. Uh, uh, 14.6. Eventually he was paroled and returned to Gulfport with his wife and the first thing they did was uh, find a justice of the peace and get remarried. Him under his right name and, uh, and uh, that's them arriving at the train station at that time and uh, got a fresh marriage certificate and quietly retired in, in Gulfport in 1936. Uh, they returned to their house at the edge of the Gulf War. Things were quiet. Uh, Walker remained unemployed the rest of his life. Uh, most of the time, maybe a couple odd jobs, but his wife picked up seamstress work and uh, piece work of that nature. Uh, he was increasingly ill. He got a cancer diagnosis and died in 1946. And uh, they had no children, the two of them. <coughs> With his first wife, he had a daughter, but she died of uh, scarlet fever, I believe. Although that's a little inconclusive from the records at the time, uh, it may have been something of the flu. This was 1918, and uh, she may have picked up the flu somewhere. So that's our fellow over the years. Uh, Boys fellow and uh, kind of graduating through uh, through life, and by the numbers, uh, in the space of about ten years, ten years, mind you, uh, he had two marriages, one divorce, two aliases, six encounters with law enforcement, with two fatalities, uh, traveled through eight states, incarcerated five times, with three escapes, and. Uh, somehow crossed paths with uh, five prison wardens and six governors. <laughs> so in, in eventful 10 years, but after that, it was just kind of back into the common. So, so that's our story of Jesse Walker. There's a lot more detail in, in, in the book here, some side stories. Uh, I was helped in this by uh, some conversations I had with the great grandson of Jackson Stanley. Uh, he still lives in Shalom, operates a business there, and uh, there's still, still some family memories about uh, uh, Jesse's time in, in Shalom. Uh, the, the children never forgave him or murdered their father. Uh, the family of seven, and, and the, mother, the mother only lived two years after her husband was killed, but she had a family of seven kids. Mm -hmm and living in that small house. Uh, she died, the kids were, uh, uh, I won't say adopted, foster care, I guess would be the closest thing, by a business associate of the sheriff, uh, who was not particularly good to them. Uh, also had some family members, as I mentioned, from the Robinson family. Uh, J.R. Robinson was uh, uh, sort of the geneal genealogy holder of the genealogy, also a vast source of information uh, uh, all, all the way the families got intermarried. There weren't many families, but boy, were they large. And they crossed paths with each other, got married, intermarried, all that kind of stuff. His great fellow of information. And uh, his uncle. There we go. His uncle, uh, John Robinson, uh, married, married the sister of Jesse Walker's wife, I guess. And so he, he married another one of the Lambert girls. 
But uh, so that was a connection with Robinson family, the Leonard's. And uh, they, they, he could recall, you know, they would still tell tales of family gatherings. Well, whenever they started talking about uh, Jesse Walker, they get the kids off. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, they start talking in whispers about it. Um, but a fast talker, I guess, a uh, pleasant enough fellow, but uh, just seemed to bring disgrace on through his impulsive actions. Okay. So that's the story, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions we might have. Yes, sir? Did the two wives know each other? The wives did not know each other. Did he divorce his first wife? He got his divorce when he was in prison in North Carolina. Okay. And then he ducked out hmm. uh, to Mississippi. More questions? None of the family members objected to being they weren't allowed to speak up for him. No, the families of the murdered children. Yeah, yeah. So this guy gets out of jail or gets sent back. None of the family members objected to him. They, they, they petitioned the governor not to exercise clemency. Okay. Uh, there's a pretty strong letter, strongly worded letter to the governor. Uh, but uh, the governor also was looking at filing petitions from Mississippi and said he's a model citizen. And uh, he, he spent a year. He spent a year having to show good behavior. He was assigned to repainting the hospital. I guess mm -hmm. the hospital. Yeah. So. You had mentioned seven children. Uh, you were talking about the, the sheriff's seven children, or his seven children. No, he had, uh, the sheriff's seven children. Okay. Okay. But, uh, he had one daughter, Rosalie Leonard. That died. Uh, she's the one who died in 1918, which he would have found about when he was in prison. But uh, okay, so that's a, that's a story of Jesse Walker, and uh, I might uh, say that I'm working on another book. And uh, I'm going back to railroads, and uh, I'll be pitching it to the publisher, but. I'm going to be looking at the early railroads which ran out of Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's uh, some major books on it, on that. Uh, it's way too much, way too much reading. Uh, but the other extreme, the other extreme of information is like thumbnail sketches, which is too little reading. But uh, we're going to be talking about uh, in that book, um, the Wilmington and Raleigh, and Wilmington and Weldon, and Wilmington Colony and Augusta, uh, Wilmington, uh, Charlotte, Wilmington, Charlotte, Rutherford, uh, Cape Fear, and Yankton Valley. Certainly, we'll have a chapter about the WDNS. Oh, an alternative, alternative name for the initials is Wobbles, Bumps, and Shakes. <laughs> uh, it's for the nature of the track, which you build cheap track on this soil, you know what's going to happen in the cars. Go over it repeatedly. To find the soft spots. And a number of other railroads taking us up to about 1910 or so. So, 1830s to 1910. So, that, we'll see what happens with that. Thank you very much for your question. I'll let me go over uh, future programs and uh, just work, working on that. Okay, programs, upcoming programs. Uh, first on the on the on the list is uh, <clears throat> coming on October tenth. On the American Civil War, which changed uh, changed medicine, okay. and that's going to be a, a um, that's a, it's a Tuesday talk program. But it's actually going to be on Monday, uh, October the the ninth, and it'll be at the Harper Library at, at 10, a, 10 a.m. Two other um, Tuesday talk programs. Uh, the November Tuesday talk will be about Southport ships, kind of looking at the, 
the history of ships that have come into the Southport, Southport Harbor. And Tom Milner will be doing that presentation. And again, that's going to be, it's actually on a Tuesday, which makes it, <coughs> which is handy. And it will be at 10 o'clock on November 14th at the Harper Library. And then the third Tuesday talk, or the last Tuesday talk of, of the year, will be at Dickens Christmas, uh, which will be on Monday, December 11th, and Desiree Bridge will be giving that, that presentation again. Popular program, Living Voices of the Past, which we do at the Old Smithville Burying Ground. This year we'll have uh, 10 of our, our, our members and, and friends uh, portraying people in Southport's past who are buried in the, uh, the Old Smithville Burying, Burying Ground. So that will be Saturday, October 21st, starting at, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, if it rains on Saturday, we have Sunday set aside for, for a rain, rain day. Finicky, finicky. Okay, then on Wednesday, October 20, 25th at 10 a.m., um, we'll be doing a paddle through history. <coughs> program, and of course, Paddle Through History involves a kayak that you need to paddle as we go, up, go along. This particular kayak trip will stop at Sheep, Sheep Island, which is part of, part of Oak Island, and we will be talking about uh, three Civil War ships that are sunk in the, right close to the, in, in the inlet going into the Lock of Falling, Falling River. There's uh, two Confederate blockade runners and, and one Union blockade that are some, some there. You can, reservations for that, it's a partnership with the Adventure Kayak Company, and you can contact them for, for more information and uh, <coughs> make a reservation if you want like to go. Ever popular Chris Bondo will be here on November November 2nd <laughs> at, uh, here at the community building. So this is another evening program. And he's going to continue uh, what he the program he did last year with more curious tales of old Wilmington and the lower lower cape here. So that's that's on November 2nd, <laughs> starting at, at 6:30. Now, let me ask Mary Ellen to come up. Okay. I think I talked loud enough without the microphone, but I'll take it just in case. And they may change. Okay. Uh, just want to let everybody know that our popular BRIC program will be coming back. It will open on the 1st of October, and we will accept orders through November 30th. A 4 by 8 BRIC with three lines of text, 21 characters per line is $75, and an eight by eight brick with six lines of text is $125. So these are the different ways you, you can, uh, things you can put on a brick to recognize your family and friends, anniversaries, graduations, military service, uh, just a myriad of things you can do. Uh, the link will be sent to everyone in the October newsletter, and um, you have probably already received that. Uh, we will also be putting it on Facebook. Uh, ads will be in the Stateful Pilot and Southport Magazine as well. And you can see the pictures of the bricks that we have in front of Fort Johnston uh, Museum and Visitor Center. They are in the walkway, and they are very beautiful. Go over there sometime and look at those if you have a brick uh, look for yours, uh, and we think you will enjoy it. You will love to have one, 
And uh, we have a lot of visitors that come here and uh, all of them like to look at the bricks. So uh, if you have any questions, if you have a problem, the link will be on our website. If you have a problem putting it in, if you will call our telephone number, I will be calling you back and I will help you put it in or I will put it in for you if uh, you need to do that. Um, so the next slide, please. Okay, first time ever. This is exciting news. Uh, this will be our 32nd annual Holiday Tours of Homes, and it is part of the City of Southport and DSI's Winterfest. It will be on Saturday, December 9th, and it will run from 12 to 5 p.m. on that day. Uh, it is presented by the Southport Historical Society. The first time ever. You should have gotten an email if you are a member. For the first time, we are having a members-only pre-sale because some of you did not get a ticket in the past. So if you are a member, you will get an email. You've already been told you will get another email with the private link on it, and you will have a limit of two per membership. Uh, we are reserving half of those tickets for the uh, members only, and then the public will have uh, time to, to buy them at a later date. You can buy them uh, online up until the day they are sold to the general public, and of course you can buy yours during the general public time as well. That will be online as well as at Fort Johnston. If you want to go, please, please, please get in, go on the website, buy your ticket early. They will go fast. Membership does not guarantee you a ticket. It is first come, first serve. So uh, with that, I will go to something I don't have a slide for, and I'm just going to talk about it uh, out of my heart. Uh, I'm the membership director, and we are happy to report that we have met our goal of 400 members. And as of today, we have over 400 members. And I want to especially thank these three people sitting right here in the line because you probably helped us get to our goal, and we really appreciate it. Uh, again, for those of you who are here tonight that by any chance are not members or you forgot to pay your dues, uh, I have some change here. I have a, a membership form. If you would like to join, I'll be glad to take your money. Our dues are still so cheap. They are $15 a year for an individual and $25 a year for a couple. So if you are interested in that, please do so. If you happen to pay tonight, or before the end of the year, you will get these three months for free, and then your dues will not be due again until 2025, the beginning of 2025. So that's all I have. If you want to do that tonight, I will be around. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yes, sir. So again, thank you, thank you all for, for coming, and if someone will give me a, uh, make a motion to adjourn, Motion to adjourn. Motion to, to adjourn. Uh, all Second. in favor? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, now you can adjourn yourself right over the table and buy one of these great books. <laughs>